Okay, so in today's webinar, we're going to do NPE 101. Basically, what we're going to cover today is, is in fair part, what I tend to cover in the first training. Um, so we're going to cover specifically working with contacts. Um, we're going to talk about adding contacts, connecting contacts to each other, uh, specifically adding people as organization contacts and adding uh, people together in relationships. Um, we're going to talk about emails a little bit and communication preferences. We're going to talk about adding addresses. Um, and we're going to also talk about some of the various things you can do from the contacts list, such as advanced search, import, um, add multiple contacts, things like that. And we're also going to touch on contact types and affiliations. Now, if your intention is that your users will be a bit more restricted and won't be able to set these up, um, they may not, this might not be pertinent for them. Um, but if you're still, you know, tinkering with your contact types and affiliations, then that'll be helpful. Um, unlike what I normally do in an initial training, I'm not going to talk about programs and campaigns, nor am I going to talk about donations, since those tend to be handled uh, specifically in the webinars for donations. So without further ado, let's uh, dive right in. So when you first log in, you'll be here on the, the dashboard, the overall dashboard. So when you start wanting working with contacts, so that's probably what you're going to do first off the bat. We go ahead and we go to contacts, individuals, or contacts, organizations, depending on whether or not you're working with individuals or organizations. So let's go ahead and go to individuals. Okay, so here we have our individual contact list. And we actually have two ways we can look at this list. Um, the first way is, well, for me, it's currently set to the expanded view. And so what the expanded view does is it gives you a little bit of extra contact information. So aside from the name, it also tells you where they work. It also tells you their address and their email and a few other, and, you know, I, I think contact types are shown no matter what. And so this is handy for if you just want to have a handful of people per page. The page limit <clears throat> for this view maxes at 500. So most of the time, this is the, one, the view I like to use. But sometimes you want, might want it displayed a little differently. So for that, we also have the summary view. So let's switch over to that. Um, so with um, the summary view, things are displayed a little bit differently. So instead of just having first name, last name combined together, it actually gives you first name and last name as separate fields. This actually allows you to then sort by last name. So I know a lot of people actually prefer sorting by last name. And so if you're one of those folk, you can um, use the summary view and just sort by last name. And while this view does give you the email, you notice that it doesn't give you much more. It doesn't give you the address or the organization that they work for. So this is kind of a compacted view. It's a summary. However, in this view, the maximum page can go to 1,000. So while this might not be important in most cases, when you start working with the Take Action dropdown, which we'll cover a little bit later, then you'll be able to, to modify more contacts at once. So, OK. So that's the views. So let's then move from here to what most people will be, you know, it's kind of the basics of adding a contact. So when you want to add a contact, what we go ahead and do is we come to the Add Contact button right here. And it's going to be, the, these buttons are all going to be the same, depending, regardless of which view you're using. So to add a new contact, we go ahead and we go Add Contact. Click on the button. It'll think for a second. And then it's going to bring up the Add Edit Contact screen. So on this screen, the only two required fields are first name and last name. So let's actually go ahead and put me, although I know I'm already in this database. Um, use me as a guinea pig. And so those are the only two required fields. Now, and if you have any other information for this contact, I recommend putting it in. So if you have a prefix, a suffix, birthday, any of that, go ahead and put it in, you know, gender, what have you, because you can always search by these things later. Now, prefix, suffix, might be a, not be as useful for searching, but if you want to actually keep track of birthdays, for example, let's put me in here. You know, you can then fill in that form, and you can you can search by birth date, 
Um, specifically, you can look for the birth date specifically. You can look for the month that people are born in. You can look for people's ages. You might have to be doing a grant for how many men, women versus men you help, depending on the type of organization you have, um, and so on and so forth. Um, formal salutation, informal salutation. This is going to be used for donation acknowledgement, which I'm not going to go into today. But some people have a very specific way they like to be acknowledged. So let's actually get all fancy with me and put in my miss, my prefix, which I'm not a big fan of using. Um, so while most people, you might want to go Mr. Eric Metzler, I myself am not a big fan of being called Mr. I don't know. I just don't feel like a Mr. Um, so for my informal salutation, I probably would, I might tell you, you know, call me Eric Metzler. For my formal salutation, I might say, okay, you can go ahead and call me Mr. Eric Metzler, but not Mr. Metzler, because that's my dad. <laughs> um, so these are used for salutations. These salutations being are used for donation acknowledgement, and those would be placeholders in that, that screen. Also, and we haven't covered relationships next yet, but we will in a moment, um, you can also set household salutations. So if I had a spouse or partner listed, I could say that you will address, you know, that I prefer to be addressed as, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Eric and Taylor Metzler, as opposed to like the uh, traditional Mr. and Mrs. Eric Metzler, because we don't care for that. Um, so that gives you a little bit of control of how people are salutated, saluted, anyway. Um, so below that, crucial, crucial information, we'll come back to communication preferences, is useful for stuff that's got to be really prominent in the record. So this is actually going to show if we put in crucial information in the contact list, there'll be an ask, there'll be an exclamation mark and it'll pop up. And it will also show when we go to the, the contact details page, it'll be right there. And so what crucial information is, is like information that's so important that if you miss it, you could get yourself into trouble. If you're working with children, this could be things like um, severe allergies. Or working with anyone, it could be severe allergies. If you're working with special needs children, which is where this actually originally came from, it could be used for recording um, maybe if they've got certain triggers for certain um, behavioral issues. If there's a certain trigger that could set them off and cause an ins you know, an issue, then you might want that prominent in the record so that you know about it. You know, anything like that. Um, and it's up to you what you put in there. You could, you know, put something like never call this person because maybe you've got a contact who has basically made it very clear, never call me, and they get all irate and all that. Um, so that's what crucial information is for. Below that is contact information. And most of this is pretty straightforward, email, phone, addresses. Um, for email, if you have this, put it in. So while it's not a required field, I definitely, 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 definitely recommend putting it in there. And this is because your nonprofit easy uses email as a unique identifier. <clears throat> so out in the world, you know, there are other Eric Metzlers. I've done a Google search. Apparently there's a lot of doctors. Um, or, you know, there could be, you know, lots of John Smiths or what have you. And so we can't use name as a unique identifier because you could easily have multiple of someone with the same name, especially if you have maybe a father-son combo, you know, a, a senior and a junior. And so we can't go by first name. Further, we can't go by phone number. We Let's use that father-son combination as an example. You know, while a lot of people run off cell phones, um, not everybody just uses their cell phone. There's a lot of households still have a landline. And so we can't go by phone, uh, phone number for that reason. Because, you know, our example of, you know, John Smith and John Smith Jr., you know, they're still, you know, say John Smith Jr. is 17, still lives at home. Um, he's in your database. But he and his father are going to have the same e uh, phone number. So we can't go by phone number. The same is going to be true of addresses. If they're same, you know, you get like a father and son combo, a husband and wife, um, you know, any, you know, case where people are living at the same address, you can't use addresses in unique combination. Now, altogether you could, but we needed some way to kind of automate that, especially if you're using some sort of um, online integration. So if you're doing events or donation or membership integration with your website, we need to make the connections on the back end. So what we do is we realize that, well, email's not 100% unique, but it is as close as we're gonna get. Um, because generally speaking, most of the time, two people won't have the same address. And that's not 100% true. Sometimes you will see um, couples with, with, who will share an address. I know my wife will sometimes use my email for signing up for stuff, um, like Netflix or what have you. Um, but generally speaking, most people you know, these days has their, have their own email. 
So we use un email as unique identifier. So this means when I put in this email, only this record can have the email Eric Metzler. And in fact, I'm pretty certain that Eric Metzler at nonprofiteasy.com is going to already be in the database. So if I add it, it's actually going to tell me, hey, this email is already in use, associated with Eric Metzler. Do you want to update that record instead? So it would then transfer me over to that person. Now I'm going to go ahead and hit cancel. And I'm going to just make up an email. So let's, let's just do Eric at nonprofiteasy.com. Okay, that email doesn't exist elsewhere in the system. It's also a bad email, but we ignore that. Now for those cases where you do share an email between folk, um, what we're going to do later is we're going to create a relationship, basically connecting two people together. And when we do that, we can define them as being in a household relationship, basically meaning they're living at the same address. And so what we can do is we can, for emails, mark that it's a household email. And what that will do is we'll share it to the other members of the household. So for example, Taylor and I, are, we're gonna, I'm going to set us up in a relationship in Nonprofit Easy, and we're going to be in the same household. And so when I mark, if I have mark household, it's going to share this email to her record. So I'm actually going to go ahead and do that so we can see that come into play. So, you know, and you're also going to notice this use for communication checkbox. So you notice this for, for email, phone, and we're going to see it for addresses. This basically says, yes, use this as a means to contact this person. Now with phone number, this is not going to really have any, anything outside of your reference. It's not going to have any function. But for email, if this is not marked, we cannot send an email to this person. So that's actually going to be important that when you add emails that you mark this. Now you might be wondering, well, why even have it in there at all if you're not going to mark it? And that might be if, for example, you've got two emails for a person and one's older, but they still use it. Or for example, better example, a person has used both their personal and their work email for, 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 for whatever purposes. And, but they've made it clear that while you may have their work email for purposes of you know, records, they only want you to contact them at their personal. And so you would unmark their work one and mark their personal and so on. And so that actually brings the question of how you're going to know what's personal and what's work. And that's where email type comes in. So email type, phone type, and we'll see it later, address type. Now, Nonprofit Easy comes with a couple of these types. So let's call this a work one. And so some of these... Well, some of these have been, this is a demo, so it's not perfect, but um, we come with, you know, a handful of basic ones and you can mark multiple. So I could put a phone number in here and say it is my office phone or my office fax. Um, and if you want to configure new phone types, email types, what have you, you can go to configuration, address type, email type, and phone type. Now, if you're a user who doesn't have um, access to configuration, you won't be able to do that. Um, and you'll probably have to, and you'll have to contact whoever administrates your uh, database for you. Um, so that's phone types. I mean, that's uh, that's types. Use communication. A little touching on household. So I'm going to back up a little bit before we talk about addresses and talk about communication preferences. So use communication. Use for communications. That's kind of part of the communication preferences. So when I add an email and mark it use for com it's going to actually automatically mark the email communication options. So what these do is these actually basically tell you how does this person want to be contacted. Send mail, basically, you know, send them something to their address. This is partially for just reference, but this does have a little bit of impact when you're doing communication, uh, communication uh, donation acknowledgements. So if you mark send for email and they have an address, it will automatically mark a, a uh, donation acknowledgement to be sent by mail. You can still overwrite it, but it, if this isn't marked, it won't automatically set that for you. Phone call is totally for your reference, has no system benefit whatsoever. Um, so if, but if you want to keep track of who can and who can't be called, that's where this comes into play. But set e-communications is probably the most relevant for actually what, what actually has an impact on nonprofit easy. So while we send, e send mail, we can override that for communication, for donation acknowledgement. And that's really the only place it comes into play. Send, send email communications actually comes into play in a few different places. So for example, if I want to send an email through Nonprofit Easy, whether that's a donation acknowledgement, a newsletter, or just a general email, they need to have an email. It needs to be marked for communications. And send email must be checked. 
Now if you're working with newsletters, subscribe for newsletter must be checked also. Um, because what this is going to do is it basically is saying, what is this person giving you permission to send them? So this is more of a filter to keep in mind and not how you're actually going to designate who does receive it, but who, simply going to designate who's kind of giving you permission to receive it. Um, and I'll go more into that when we actually cover newsletters in, I think next week actually, um, might be the week after. I'll have to double check that at the end. Um, so yeah, if you're working with newsletters, you're going to need to mark this. If you're working with donation acknowledgements, you're going to need to send set the communication send email. If this is not set and there is no email to be used, you cannot send an email donation acknowledgement. So just keep that in mind. So while we can override what you set here, if this is not set, we cannot override it. Okay. So at this point, I'm just going to save just for good form. I recommend save early, save often. That old mantra from the early days, at least that I was had drilled into me back in high school, because you never know when your internet's going to die. You never know if you know your computer, if your power is going to go out or what have you. So I always recommend, you know, there's no auto save feature, you know, um, but if you're you know, ever worry that you're, you're doing a lot of data entry all at once, especially if you're starting on contact record and there's a lot in it, or a newsletter, um, save it pretty early. That way, if, you know, your power goes out, your internet dies, you know, MPE crashes, you know, what, ha what have you happens, you get pulled away for 20 minutes, you know, you don't lose what you've done. So, yeah, I believe the timeout, by the way, I believe the timeout period on nonprofit is about 30 minutes. So, um, if you haven't actually clicked a button and made something happen in 30 minutes, you will get automatically logged out. This is a security feature. So in case you walk away from your computer, it reduces the risk that someone else can walk up to your computer and just use it. Um, this isn't as big an issue in, with private offices and home work, but you know it's a general security that's implemented on most cloud-based systems. Um, if you're just typing into fields, that doesn't count as using um, because the server doesn't recognize that you're typing until you actually click a button. So something to keep in mind, especially with newsletters. Um, so if you've been working on a newsletter for a little while, like you know a couple minutes, I recommend saving because if you work on it for too long, you might lose your changes. Um, I know it's a it's a pain, um, but hopefully that'll get improved with the second edition of Nonprofit Easy coming out in six to eight months. Okay, addresses. So addresses, I only really specifically mention because there's a little bit of funniness there. Email addresses, phone numbers, you get to just fill them in. Um, but addresses are a little different than our instinct. So we can set an address type. Let's go ahead and do offer office. Let's call it an office mailing. Why not? And so this is the same. You know, we go ahead and put 1300 Valley House Drive, you know, suite 100. Room 12, I think is what I'm in right now. Maybe 13. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, so that's normal. You know, we, we, we tend to address our labels, you know, for our envelopes, you know, street, city, state, zip. But this is actually where things are going to differ. Because for Nonprofit Easy, we put the zip code first. And this seems strange because it goes against our instinct. But the reason we do this is because you'll notice that these further fields are all drop downs. And so what's going to happen, and you'll notice actually they're going to be empty for the most part. So when I type in 94928, the zip code we're located at, state, county, filled in for me, the country will default to whatever you put into your settings and organization information, and the city will actually go to a list of those cities associated with this zip code. So in this case, Rohnert Park. We're actually kind of on the border between the two. Um, so at this point, <clears throat> we can save. If you have address verification enabled, then you'll actually get to verify the address. In my demo, I don't have that available. So let's go ahead and save. And it's going to go ahead and add the record, email, the uh, address to my record. You, know, you should probably notice that on that page, there was also a use for communication checkbox available. So a little bit later, I'm going to talk, when we do relationships, I'll mention how to share addresses between folk. Because I showed you how we can share an email. I'm also going to show you how you can share an address. So before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about demographic information and miscellaneous. This is basically when you when you if you got a brand new system, these would be empty for you, and these are left completely under your control. So over the years, folk have been you know playing with our demo system. So we've added a couple of ethnicities, including a fake one that doesn't exist. Um, 
and apparently you can be Martian, you know, all those things. But you can configure this to exactly what you need. We have one organization that actually uses it for religion, for, for religion, as opposed to a, um, you know, country of origin kind of ancestral thing. So you can use it as you need to. And you can configure these by going to configuration, um, employment status, marital status, parenting status, um, uh, housing status, ethnicity, so on and so forth. Once again, if you don't have administrative access, you may not be able to see this. Um, so these are left to you as a user and as an organization to configure as you need. If you don't need them, ignore them. If you need more, custom data sets, and, um, which I won't go into right now. Um, okay, so at this point, we have, um, we've added a contact, we've saved it, we've added an email, we've, we've added some contact information, maybe we added some demographic information. So now let's talk about how do we connect people together? How do we connect contacts together? And so what we're going to do, since we're already right here, is we're going to connect Eric Metzler here to an organization. And so what we can do is we can do it right here from work information. We can even create a new con new organization contact um, straight from this screen. So to create to connect someone to an organization, basically saying that they're working there, maybe they did work there, or maybe they've just got a really close relationship that you can more or less, you know, maybe it's a volunteer that it's there so frequently that you might as well consider them an employee or an intern or something like that. So we come to work information. No records found. So we're going to click the add button. You might actually have noticed this by now that nonprofit easy, we try to be pretty consistent with our buttons. Um, whenever we have something to add, there'll be a plus button. You notice that on the contact list, that there's that big um, plus button. Here we have a little plus button, you know, save buttons, cancel buttons, what have you. So we're going to go ahead and click add. Okay, <clears throat> so what we do here now is let's we type in the name of the organization. Now, if the organization already exists, we're going to get a drop down as we type that we can choose from. So if I type in Nonprofit Easy, here we have Nonprofit Easy. Now, if Nonprofit Easy didn't already exist, we could type something in here and add as organization contact. And then that will actually create a new record for Nonprofit Easy. Or we can leave this blank and just leave it and fill in some information and just leave it as kind of like a note. So no contact records created, no cross references created. It's more of just like a note. This person works there. We aren't too worried about that organization. We maybe we never have any dealings with them. But let's actually go ahead and make a connection. So let's pick Nonprofit Easy. So at this point, it's going to give us a little bit of information about the organization that's currently be configured, you know, an address. It's going to give you the primary contacts email, um, so on and so forth. We can add a phone number, add an address, but I'm not going to do any of that right now. And then we can put the person's job title. So I could say my job title there is customer support. Actually, it's officially customer experience team member, but we keep it simple. And then contact for is used for, well, what would you contact this for, person for? Um, you know, if you're contacting the organization through this person, why would you talk to this person specifically? So for me, it would be customer support and training and oddballs, things here and there. Um, and then we mark, is this person currently working there? So in this case, I am. And then we can go ahead and save. <clears throat> okay, so here we have it. Nonprofit Easy has been added to my record. I am actually probably put me as the primary contact. I think that means primary contact. And this is a current organization of mine. And, you know, a little other information has been available. So um, at this point, I can save. And if I, if I actually click on this, it's going to take me to Nonprofit Easy. So I'm going to do that in a second. We're going to cover it more later, but I don't, I'm probably not going to come back to it here. But for when, you, when we do add affiliations later, that'll be done here. And the rest of this is custom data sets. So you, most of this probably won't be present for you. OK, so let's go ahead and save. And let's go ahead and go to Nonprofit Easy rec Nonprofit Easy's record. So I click on the name, and it takes me to Nonprofit Easy. So here we have it. The details for Nonprofit Easy. It'll actually show me as an org mem as an organization contact. Um, so let's actually go ahead and edit this because we're going to talk briefly about primary contact. 
So I mentioned you can share things, information between p individuals through relationships and households. But what happens when you want to share an email to an organization? Perhaps, for example, there is an organization where you don't want to contact the info at email, but you want to contact someone specifically in the organization. They are the primary contact for that organization. They're the ones that you contact when contacting that organization. So for that, we have, and I keep repeating myself, primary contact. So you'll notice that Missy Singh is marked as the primary for, for Nonprofit Easy. And so what this does, it actually shares her email to the organization. So if we email the organization, it'll actually email her. So this is one way you'll know if something's shared. You'll notice that we can edit and delete. This should say test, but someone is typing too fast. Um, we can't, we can edit this, this Gmail address, this test, but we can't edit Missy's. And the reason we can't edit hers is because it's being shared. So if you ever come across an address or an email that you cannot edit, it is being shared from another contact. In the case of an organization, it's being shared from the primary. In the case of an individual, it's being shared from another, from another household member. Now, it can be a little tricky to know which household member if there's multiple. So um, usually it'll be a parent or a spouse unless there was a data entry issue. So that might take a little investigation. Um, but if you ever come across an email address or just a physical address you can't edit or work with, it's being shared. So in this case, when you, you, know, when you want to contact Nonprofit Easy, you actually want to contact us at our support email, which I think is already in the database, so I'm not going to put in. But in which case, you wouldn't want to contact us at, you know, contact Missy directly. So let's actually unmark her as the primary. It'll now be gray. And so if I save the record, it'll actually update and remove her email address. Ta-da. Okay. So at this point, let's actually go back to Eric Metzler's record. Because now that I've shown you how to connect an individual to an organization, and by the way, an organization has based, has more or less the same fields that an individual has. It just won't have the demographic fields, and instead of first name, last name, it's going to have organization name and a few other different fields. But it's basically the same. Um, but coming back to Eric Metzler's record, let's go ahead and create a relationship. So to do that, we can either edit the record and go to the Relationships tab, or we can go to Relationships and click the Add button. Remember I mentioned there's some consistency in our buttons, so Add, Edit, Preview. And delete is the X. But let's go ahead and add. So let's go ahead and let's add a contact. So here we actually get a choice. We can either add a brand new contact to the database and make the connection, or we can select from an existing one. If we click Add Contact, it'll give us a, a mini Add Contact screen. It's not the full screen, but it's just a, enough to put in some information. You can, if you have any more you need to fill out, you can fill it out later. Otherwise, you would, you know, you'd go in separately fill out all the information, and then come back to one of the records and link them, which is what we're going to do now. So I'm actually going to go select from existing. And I'm quite certain Taylor's in here. Yep, there she is, Taylor Metzler, our other support person. And I'm going to submit and add her. So, oh, OK. So here I was going to make Taylor Metzler the, I'm not sure why I went to apprentice, but the spouse of Eric Metzler. But I actually notice that Eric Metzler and her already have a relationship. So, you know, if, um, if someone already has relationships in the system, then you can actually kind of cross the relationship. So let's say instead of being Eric, this had been, you know, if we had a, if we had a older child in the who is happened to be in the database, it would say maybe the child, you know, it would say maybe Eric Metzler Jr. is the child of Taylor Metzler. And then, so you could then go, okay, Eric Metzler Jr. is the child of Eric Metzler while you're creating the connection between Eric and Taylor. So, so what we do here, so let's ignore this part down here for the moment and say, so Taylor Metzler is the spouse of Eric. And then we have the check box box. Are they in the same household? So this is how we're going to designate people to be in the same household together. So we would mark they are in the same household, same household, and we would see, you know, which address do we want to use. So if Taylor Metzler had a rec had an address in her record, we could share that to Eric, 
or in this case, if Eric Metzler has an address in his record, we can share, the, share that to Taylor. At which point in the address information section, we're going to see, um, we'll see Eric Metzler. So let's actually go ahead and do that. And then we'll clean up this little mess we've, I've just made in a minute. So, you know, so let's go ahead. So they are in the same household. We're going to use Eric's address. And we're going to use this one. Now you might wonder, well, why do we even have to check it? We have to check it because there may possibly be two addresses listed. Maybe one's my work and the other's my home. And I might not want to share my office to Taylor. But in this case, we work in the same place, so it works out. Um, so I'm going to save and close. So now we're going to see relationships. Taylor Metzler is now a spouse. We've been given the household contact type. So this indicates that we are in a household together. When I, as I add donations and things to the record, we'll get the donor contact type, we might get the membership, you know, any of the system defined ones. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, so a few other things we can do from here is I can send emails to this person specifically. I can make or view special comments, so notes. I can, since they've got an address, I can print envelopes with their mailing address. Kind of cool, brand new feature. It'll come out as a PDF, which then you have to configure much like you would do um, the envelopes and donation acknowledgement. Um, configure layout settings. So this is kind of nifty. So some, this is by user. So this is going to be a per user basis. So any changes I make here will only affect me. It won't affect Taylor or anybody else in my organization. But this lets me reorganize those sections you see depending on what you want to see. So if you're the membership coordinator, you don't need to see giving details. You want membership right there at the top. So I can put membership right here at the top. And so, or I can remove something entirely. So, you know, I can move things around. You know, if I'm the volunteer coordinator, I can use that, move that around. So let's go ahead. So giving details was at the top before. So let's put membership and volunteer at the top. And we're going to save it. I'm going to go back to the contact. And here we have it. Now we have given details below membership details. And like I said, this is only going to affect you. It won't affect any other user. If we want to edit a user, I mean a contact, we click the edit button. And then we've got 360 degree contact view, which is kind of like a mini personal report. So if I click on this, I will get, you know, I'll get the, get, make some options and I'll get basically a personal report for that person. Events they've attended, volunteer information, either for a time frame or all of it, or like a summary. It's pretty cool. Um, you can get it as a PDF or printed out HTML. Okay. Um, and send newsletter and stuff like that. Um, so let's actually go back to in the individual contact list. So now we've added people together. Uh, we've added a contact. We've connected a contact to an organization. We've, contact we've connected two, or two individuals to each other using relationships. We've set stuff as household. Um, we've added you know, emails and phone numbers and what have you. So that's the basics of working with a contact. Um, but we've got a few other things we're going to be doing with contacts. One of them is going to be dealing with duplicates. So, for example, let's switch back to the expanded view. And let's use these search by fields. So we can search by name, which is going to check first and last, or we can look by first name or last name or nickname or any other, uh, this other information. But let's keep it on name. And let's look for Eric Metzler. And then we hit go. So this is going to bring up all the Eric Metzlers in the system. So we've got two. Well, we don't want two. There's only one Eric Metzler. He's, he's, he's plenty. We don't need more. So what we can do is we can merge them together. So we go ahead and we check both their names. And we use the Take Action dropdown. So in this dropdown, we've got a couple of things we can do. You know, we can add an interaction or task. We can... You know, add a new contact, which won't affect these ones. We can assign affiliation or communication preferences. This one's a step, uh, definitely useful if you haven't used newsletters before and you want to assign new newsletter preferences for like your entire database. Um, that is also where using the summary view at 100 per page is going to come in handy because you're going to have to do it one page at a time, but doing 1,000 at a time is not too bad. Now, if you've got maybe more than 3,000 contacts, 4,000, 5,000, you know, somewhere in like the tens of thousands, Shoot us an email, and we'll do it from the back end because that could take you forever. 
Um, but if you just got like one or two thousand, two thousand, it'll be way quicker to just do it yourself. Um, and what you do is you just select, you set to a thousand, select all with this checkbox, and use like communication preferences. Um, but among these is merge duplicates. So what we're going to do is we're going to select merge duplicates and go. It's going to think for a second, and it's going to take us to the duplicate search results screen. Now, since we started by selecting two people to merge individually, it's going to kind of take us right here. If you play with that drop down, you'll notice there's a couple other search duplicate options. There's a, you know, search duplicates, there's a search duplicates, which basically will search through everybody you select for duplicates based on the criteria. Or there's actually also a search duplicates from database option, which will search the entire database for duplicates based on a certain criteria. And will give you, a, in both cases, will give you them listed here. When the search by database is done, you'll also get this merge duplicates option here, visible, which will take you to the screen. So once you select the ones you want to merge, whether from, the, from a list or because you did them beforehand, you'll get them listed here. And you're going to get their contact information listed here. And so everything like contact types, donations, memberships, all that stuff will be automatically merged. So you don't even have to think about it. Same with affiliations, relationships, so on. So this may end up resulting in me being a spouse to Taylor twice, but we'll find out about that um, in a moment. But in this case, contact information takes a little bit of the human touch. Um, for example, maybe I have two addresses listed, or two emails. Here's a good example. We have two emails. Actually, we have three. And we'll notice that these two records, one's older. Now, let's say, for example, this record here is like five years old, and this one's brand new. Then for the case of maybe an address, you might choose, well, this address is outdated, most likely, I probably don't want it. This is probably the new address, so I could check that address. You know, we get to choose which name to use. So, Mr. Eric Metzler, which email do we want to use? Now, in this case, I recommend take them all. Um, it can't you do you any harm. If one of them's bad, the system's going to handle that for you using um, the email verification service. So you won't even have to think about that part. Um, and in case it is a good email that they're still using for maybe online events. This will make sure that everything gets connected and you don't get another duplicate. And the rest of it, you just check as you need. Um, you know, contact source, probably take that from the oldest record. Now, communication preferences. Um, you're going to probably wonder, well, which one do I take? Because it doesn't give you the details. What I recommend, take the communication preferences from whichever, con whichever contact you take the email from. If you take it from both, take it from the eldest record. Because that's the one they've probably been sending to. And it's probably the one they've, if they've unsubscribed for anything, will have that recorded. At which point we hit merge. And it's going to give us basically a preview. This is what you're going to get. And then we hit save. So at this time, there's now only going to be one Eric Metzler in our database. So let's go ahead and pull him up and see what that has to say. So we go back to contacts individual. Let's look for Eric Metzler. There's only one. Let's go ahead and go in him because I want to see what happened with that relationship. So it actually cleaned up the relationship for us. They realized that there's only going to be one spouse, so it fixed that for us. I think children, it probably wouldn't have fixed that for us, but spouse and partner, I believe it does. Okay, so uh, I mentioned importing. So we have more options than just individually adding folk. Um, I mean, we, we can add them individually, either by clicking on the Add Contact button, or as we're making doing other things in the nonprofit easy, we can create them individually that way. Um, but let's say you've got a file, uh, an Excel file, with a list of contacts. So what you can do is you can take that list and you can save it as a CVS file, so comma separated value file. It's the simplest spreadsheet possible to make. Um, basically, every field is delimited by a comma. Um, so what you'll do is you're, you'll get your, your list of folk. Maybe you've pulled it out of MailChimp or Constant Contact. And you're going to need to make sure that file has a first name, a last name, and an email field. Now, if the email field is empty, that's okay. First name and last name, they'll have to have something in there. And then you can also have other basic contact information such as, you know, street address, zip code, state, e you know, I think you get two more email fields, 
and some some phone numbers. So it's basic contact information. So let's actually run through an import really quick. Um, I've got a file that we can use to bring it up. So I'm going to click on import. It's going to bring up this page. It more or less steps you through the process. You select your file. And I'm pretty certain I've got a, here it is. We'll go open, next step. And then what we do here is we map. So the prefix field in nonprofit easy maps to what field in my file. It doesn't map to anything. So first name, what's that map to? Maps to first, F name. Last name to last name, email address to email, personal email. So we get a couple other fields. And so each one of these, would, if you wanted to put it in, would have to be a, com a column inside your Excel document. Now, organization name takes a little bit of comment. So what this will do, so if you've got a file that has, say, you know, Eric, you know, has Eric Metzler, and one of the columns is organ name, and when that in my record it says nonprofit easy, what we can do is we can map that to the org name field. And so we get two options. You remember that when we added an individual to an organization, we had a choice. We can either create the organization or we can simply add it as a note. And we get that choice here. So this is actually kind of new. If we add an organization as a contact, it will actually create nonprofit easy. Now this could result in duplicates. You may have to do some deduping in your organizations. Or you can uncheck this, you'll get no duplicates, but there'd simply be a note in the contacts record. So that's up to you if you want to do that or not. Let's actually go ahead and, well, it's not going to matter here because I don't actually have that field. But um, let's actually, let's actually complete the mapping because I think this will work. This file's legit. Um, state abbreviation. Oh, it's country. Zip code, zip. Okay, so doo -doo -doo -doo, that should be sufficient. And let's actually go import. So where your request for import will be query queued up, and you'll be sent an email once it is completed. And so that email will actually let you know if something has failed. Um, I believe I have one from earlier today I can show you. So here we go. Here was an import that was ran by somebody in the demo earlier today. And so these people could not be imported. And it's going to tell you why. So maybe there was missing information or duplicate email existed. So then you could take this and you can handle it as needed, such as, you know, taking a look at your original Excel file and um, cleaning it up or what have you. So that's how we can do import. So related to import, let me minimize my email again, related to import is add multiple contacts. So if import's useful, if you've got an export from say MailChimp or Constant Contact or some other on, you know, digital source, add multiples when you've got a physical source. So let's go ahead and add multiple contacts. So this can be useful. Let's say you had an event. Maybe you were at a, um, a seminar. Maybe you had a booth somewhere, you know, and you had a sign-up sheet, a physical sign-up sheet. This will be helpful for entering the information from that sign-up sheet. So once again, it's basic information, first name, last name, email, stuff like that. So this will let you add basically your sign-up sheet, whatever you had, and, you know, pretty quickly. So just like import, because I had basic contact information, but lets you add multiple at once. All right, so let's go back to the individual contact list. We come back here a lot. And let's talk about the last option on this page. Okay, almost last. We also have export, which is a very basic export of, to Excel option for what's currently listed. And that's actually more useful once we've used advanced search. So advanced search is basically a, a simplified version of reports. If you haven't worked with reports yet, then this is a good place to kind of start playing without all the overhead of reports. So we click on the advanced search button and we get an advanced search screen. Now, if this is gonna be a one-time search that we never run again, we don't need to give it a name. If we plan to run this search again, we can give it a name and then use the save as in search option at the end. But let's just run this search. So here we actually have criteria. And these are pretty basic criteria, pretty basic. Um, these are basically just the fields within nonprofit easy, including custom fields. So if we wanted to see everybody who has a physical address, we could do street address is not empty. For example, if we wanted to combine 
various criteria. We also can search by and or or, basically, which is and is all, any is or. So if I want to see anyone who's got a street address or an email, I could do that. So I could say street address is not empty, and down in contact information is email. So I could do email is not empty. So this is if someone's got both a street address and an email, they're going to come up. So let's actually run that one. So then I'm going to search. So, and then you could search by other things like contact type is donor uh, or whatever. So here's all my contacts who have both an email and a physical address. That gives me 486. And using it, like I said, using advanced search, we can search for all sorts of things, including contact types. So if you want to find all your donors, you can do contact type is donor. And so when I run this search, it's going to give me everybody who's a donor which is probably going to be like something like a couple hundred. So 105, smaller than I thought. And that's just for the individuals. If I wanted to look at organizations, I'd have to go to that list. Okay, so we're running, we're getting pretty close to the end here. Um, so at this point, I've mentioned affiliations and contact types. So I'm going to touch on those because whether or not you're, con you're the person who can configure them or will configure them, you're going to need to know how to use them. So some of the contact types are auto-assigned. So member, donor, volunteer, household, okay, just those four, and a handful of others will be assigned for you as you enter information into contact records. So if you add a donation, the donor contact type will be automatically added, and you don't have to do anything. It's hands off. Um, however, those types can't be added manually without saving information. So to add a contact type, so we can actually have an example. Let's go into someone who's not deceased. Oh, which I should mention about deceased. So let's go into Adam. Let's go to Adam Frank. I only have one of them. And let's edit him. So to add a contact type, whether it's one system defined or defined by you, you basically just check the box up here. And you'll get a tab that goes with it. Now, if I add the, uh, let's find here, volunteer contact type, and go to the volunteer tab, this won't save, won't stay, unless they actually add information into that record. Now with the volunteer one, you can add it as simply as the volunteer since date. With donors and members, you actually have to add a donor donation or membership. Now for one that you've defined, such as um, art purchaser, I can save this without adding information. So if the volunteer, in order for this to save, I have to add a volunteer sin state. So watch if I save it without doing that, aside from the fact that there's a whole bunch of required fields, it's actually good. Let's go back to the personal info tab. So if I go back to the personal info tab and try to save from there without adding volunteer information. It won't keep. So if I go back to view contact, he didn't get made into a volunteer. OK. So that's how you're going to add contact types. And, I sh and with affiliation, it's basically the same thing. It's you edit the record, you go down to the here it is, affiliation section, click add, and select from the list of affiliations. Now, if you actually want to add a new affiliation, you can actually do it from right here. So what what is, the diff what is a contact type and what's an affiliation? So a contact type, which is configured through configuration contact type, is a flag. It's a way to create lists. So a contact type is something important about the contact, something that many contacts are going to have in common, something that's so important it needs to be prominent in the record. It needs to be searchable, you know, it needs to be right there up on the top and, you know, use, and easily found. So it's things like donor, volunteer, member. Um, if you're an arts organization, it might be artist. If you're a organization that ha works with students and teachers, it might be student, it'll be teacher. If you're an organization who has um, clients of any sort, then you might have a client contact type um, and so forth. 
So it's something important. It's commonality. Um, it, it, so you know, it comes with this contact type, which you can specify either from our library or from a contact type you found, uh, an icon you found. Um, and what's more, you can also attach data to it. So the system-defined ones like donor have you know donation data and so forth. With custom data sets, you can connect data set and thus new fields to a contact type. So a contact type, wrapping it all together now, is a flag where it says that this person and the others who also have this flag have some aspect in common, something very important, something we might be saving data about. So student grades, you know, teacher, um, um, student, uh, teacher waivers, things like that. Um, so that's what contact types come into play. Now, sometimes you don't need all that. You don't need the icons. You don't need it at the top. You don't need all the data sets. Sometimes you just need basic lists. So for example, let's say you want to keep a list of everybody who's in the Rotary Club. You know, you, you know, the Rotary Club, it's not that big a deal. They don't need to be a contact type. You don't need an icon. But you just want to keep a basic list. So for that, we have affiliation. Affiliation is basically the 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 uh, contact types light. It's for simple lists. So for example, sometimes I see folk use it for their general mailing list. So if they have a physical mailing list that they send out and they want to demarcate that someone is on that mailing list, they'll sometimes use an affiliation. Sometimes they'll use contact type. It could go either way. That one's a bit debatable, but you know, cases like Rotary Club, Boy Scouts, um, people belong to a club, things like that. Um, you would use an affiliation. And so that would be done through configuration affiliation. As mentioned, if you don't have admin access, if maybe your user account isn't set up for that, you won't be able to add these. So I almost forgot something, something really important too. So two things. One, sometimes folk are inclined to put couples in as a single record. So they'd put the first name of Eric and Taylor and the last name of Metzler. We strongly, strongly discourage this for two reasons. Well, actually, because a myriad of reasons. Two of the main ones. One, accuracy. It's inaccurate. Um, if Taylor Metzler signs up for an event, Eric Metzler does not, and it's put under both those records, we don't know whom of those two actually attended the event. Now, that might not be that big a deal right off the bat, but later it could become important. For example, we want to email all the people who attended an event. So we send out that email and it goes to Eric instead of Taylor. So you get kind of confusions like that. Um, or let's say they both attend the event. So we, they both attend the event and the, you know, the, the registration is logged into both their names, but when we pull reports later, it's gonna look, it, could, it might just look like one person, especially if you use the individual um, contact report view. So it makes inaccuracies. Furthering along that line is, you know, so we've put Eric and Taylor in one record. And so let's say, once again, Taylor attended an event. Eric's never attended an event. Later on, let's say Eric and Taylor separate. Or, you know, as, as sometimes happens, one of them passes on. So now let's say Taylor passes and, um, you know, you send out an email to all your event attendees. Now you've sent an email to Eric instead of Taylor saying, hey, we know you attended that event, you know, come attend this next one. And Taylor, you know, Eric emails back, that was my wife, she's passed, I'm very upset now because you remind, you know, stuff like that. The same thing on happens and then with divorces, you know, especially with donations, it, it just makes a mess. So what we recommend is, is keep the people separate and make a relationship between them. Sorry if I stress, overstress that, it, it comes up often. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, coming back a bit, how do you mark someone as deceased? Okay, a bit of a train jump there. Um, so what you can do, let's say someone passes on. Let's say um, Alder Moore has passed on. So what you'll do is you edit their record. And you'll see this active versus deceased. So you might be wondering what's the difference? So active basically means this person is an active contact in our database. We, we interact with them occasionally. Um, you know, 
what have you, you can ignore it entirely. Just see if everybody is active, never think about it. Now, if you haven't heard from a contact in 10 years, but you don't know if they're dead, deceased or not, you might just set them as active or you might set them as inactive just so you know that maybe I shouldn't waste my postage on this person um, and what have you. But if someone actually passes, then you'll... Yes, so if active is unchecked, that means they are inactive. And we're actually going to see that now when we set this person to de deceased. So deceased is exactly what you think it is. It means the person has passed and it will flag them as such. So let's mark them as deceased. They are no longer active and we can even specify the date on their, of their passing. So we could say this one person passed on the 5th of March. And so that's more mostly for your reference. Um, if you don't know the date of passing, you can, don't have to put it. And so what this is going to do now, once it saves, is if I go into the contact record, it'll say this contact is deceased. Ooh, this contact is deceased. This information will also pop up with things like memberships. If you're trying to renew someone's membership and they're deceased, it'll, it'll tell you. Um, as you noticed, it shows in the individual contact report by putting this red background on them. One thing to note, though, is deceased contacts, inactive contacts, are not automatically removed from any list in Nonprofit Easy, except for, I think, from newsletters. So if you're running a report and you don't want to see deceased folk in your report, you'll need to add the criteria deceased is, uh, is not true or deceased is no. Um, because we don't want to make that assumption with a report that you don't want those folk. Because, for example, if you're running a donation report for the year, if you remove deceased folk and a deceased person made a donation, you might be handing this to your accountant. They're going, "Well, I'm missing a donation because, you know, if you if so, if you omit the the uh, deceased people, sometimes you'll you'll lose information. So just be careful. That's why we also don't make the assumption. We leave it to you. So uh, stat contact status and deceased." are two flags you may want to check against when running reports. So at this point, I think I got it all. We have covered adding contacts, adding organizations, connecting individuals to organizations, uh, connecting individuals to each other with relationships and households. Um, we've talked about adding information such as addresses and contact emails. Um, we've talked about a little bit about communication preferences. We talked about most of the buttons on the add contact screen. Um, so let's see what else to review. We talked about importing, add multiple contacts, searching um, report. We talked about the two various views. We talked about the take action drop down along with merging. And we talked about contacts and affiliations. So I believe, I believe we got everything. <laughs>